Geopolitics and Empire is joined by Kurt Hackbarth, who's a writer, playwright, freelance journalist. He writes on Mexico and Latin America for Jacobin Magazine. Welcome to Geopolitics and Empire, Kurt. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been enjoying your your work uh, for quite a while and find uh, most of the time I'm agreeing with your uh, analysis. And, you know, listeners have been asking sort of to get a you know big picture take on Mexico, a number of listeners, you know, have come down to live, uh, to uh, uh, Im have immigrated like myself to uh, mm -hmm. Mexico, and maybe to start to get your sort of broad lay of the land on Mexico, the political parties, you know, we don't have to go into too much deal detail. But my view has been that for the longest time, the American empire and transnational corporate interests have sort of managed Mexico to an extent from behind the scenes. Uh, yeah, I did the interview a couple of years back with Jefferson Morley, who declassified mm -hmm. the, the documents on how uh, now it's four Mexican presidents four. Uh, yeah, yeah, have literally been CIA agents, probably more. Uh, and often when Mexican presidents finish their term, they go off to teach at the Ivy League, like Calderon, which again tells you they're agents of empire. And, uh, you know, as a conservative, I recognize that a lot of the conservative Mexican parties basically sell out their country to the highest foreign bidder and work hand in hand with U.S. interests. But, you know, Mon AMLO, um, you know, from the people that I've talked to here in Mexico, from across the political spectrum, uh, the, the answer that I get is that many feel that AMLO has been the least worst president in the longest time. And I do see in his rhetoric and actions, he has been attempting to protect Mexican sovereignty and call out American empire. So maybe if you could give us sort of your overview of how you see uh, you know, Morena, Pan, Pri, uh, and, and the, you know, the, the overt and covert Mexican political, uh, structure. Okay. Well, that's, that's a big, uh, a big question to start. So let's just get right into it. Um, I think you're absolutely right that the United States has, you know, treated Mexico very much as its, as its backyard. Um, uh, and this of course goes back to the Monroe Doctrine and this idea that all of the Americas, um, is a possession of the United States. This is something that, you know, Indirectly, and this is something that AMLO has spoken, uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador has spoken very clearly about uh, in his morning press conferences. He has a daily press conference for two, sometimes upwards of three hours a day, where he takes all kinds of questions from all corners. So some really interesting stuff comes out uh, at times. <clears throat> um, at the moment, um, the governing party in Mexico is known as uh, Morena. <clears throat> Morena stands for Movimiento de Regeneración Nacional, or the National uh, Regeneration Movement. And it's also an acronym for a dark-skinned woman, una morena. <clears throat> so it's actually a very clever um, acronym from a political standpoint. In a country that's 80% mestizo and indigenous. <clears throat> you know, that's very important uh, to remember. Mm -hmm. um, Morena was born as a political party in 2014, so it's had a very um, vertiginous rise as a political party. Four years after its founding, it won the presidency in both houses of Congress, and then um, in the midterm elections of 2021, held both houses of Congress. And if the polls uh, are correct, is uh, the very clear front runner for the presidential election in 2024. And this, you know, in a context of pandemic, in a context of international global shocks, um, you know, supply chain, all, you know, um, all of the stuff we've seen over the last two years that has uh, knocked a lot of world leaders around. And you have Lopez Obrador, who, according to most polls, is um, the second most popular leader in the world. And so um, that in and of itself is a very interesting phenomenon that I think hasn't been looked at enough. You know, how a party in four years can take power and hold power in the face of a lot of a lot of pressure from national and international media, which have been bludgeoning uh, AMLO <clears throat> constantly. So I think that's one that's one thing. Um, the opposition parties are the two main opposition parties in Mexico. One of them is the PRI, the Institutional Revolutionary Party. This was basically the hegemonic party of state that ran Mexico for over seventy years in the twentieth century, uh, from the late nineteen twenties had a different name, but it was the same same beast um, <clears throat> through to the election of uh, of 2000. So the PRI was it in Mexican politics um, in the 20th century. And um, <clears throat> the other opposition party is the National Action Party, which is, um, you know, the classic uh, conservative Catholic aligned party. But both parties now are, are polling 
really poorly uh, due to decades of scandals uh, and corruption um, and mismanagement when they were in, when they were in power. And the weakness of those parties has also helped, you know, AMLO and Morena uh, significantly. So that's kind of the general panorama of uh, of the parties. Um, presidents can uh, only serve one six year term in Mexico, and that is something that goes back to the revolution. The idea of no re-election was a big rallying cry in Mexican politics. So that's kind of a long-standing tradition here. There's now re-election for local offices and even for Congress people, but not for presidents. So AMLO can't run again. So the big question is, who is the Morena candidate going to be? Because very likely, whoever that candidate is going to be, is going to be the next president of Mexico. And yeah, and, and maybe to get a little more into AMLO, you've uh, got a lot of great articles uh, on Jacobin. And again, I, I've, I've talked to uh, people here in uh, Mexico from both sides. Uh, and again, I, you know, I remember that the, they're telling me he, he's the least worst. I mean, he seems to have, uh, as I've, uh, you know, what's important for me, it seems like he has attempted to retain Mexican sovereignty when it's, you know, in the question of GMOs and agriculture, you know, to, to keep that from the transnationals, uh, the petroleum, the lithium that was nationalized, the uh, electricity, he just uh, bought out uh, additional percentage uh, of the electricity. And so Mexico now has a monopoly, uh, um, uh, CFE, uh, I think 56%. Uh, so th that keeps right. the price prices for us low, uh, keeping Siapa, you know, the water uh, service, uh, public utility and keeping the prices low, stuff like this, I find like, I mean, that's good. For me, it's like not an issue of left or right. Like it's it's about protecting your country's stuff, uh, the citizens stuff from, uh, you know, foreign imperial interests, whether it's you know, Washington or these transnational corporations. Yeah. And so, um, you know, your further sort of scorecard on AMLO, I, I kind of don't buy this, as you've mentioned, that he's undermining democracy. I don't see that. But what I am concerned of is this militarization of Mexico giving more power to the National Guard, Mexican military. I read that uh, they just got some unconstitutional power where they can uh, detain us uh, citizens. And then I did read that the Mexican military has been using uh, Pegasus and this uh, Israeli s software to spy on us uh, illegally. It was reported they've got some bunker now where they're just illegally spying on all Mexicans. And I did have a past guest, Ed Calderon. Uh, no, is it what, uh, was it Ed Calderon, the guy who was on Joe Rogan, who said that, you know, this is maybe the Mexican the deep state, you know, which is centered around the military, which, you know, maybe AMLO is, you know, has to butt heads with them sometimes, but, you know, your, your further thoughts on yeah. any of this and, and AMLO. Well, I think it's interesting um, um, that, you know, you come from a, a more conservative point of view, because it's interesting that AMLO, there was a poll that just came out the other day, AMLO attracts support from the left, right, and center. And I think that's, that's an interesting phenomenon of AMLO. And it's part of why his popularity rating has remained high, and which is why Morena has has retained a high popularity rating. It's it's a broad coalition uh, that supports uh, AMLO's reforms, and I think that's important. Actually, um, <clears throat> I think you're right to mention the word sovereignty when it comes to AMLO. Um, AMLO is very clear that um, you can't have an independent country if you're dependent on you know another country energetically and for foodstuffs and you know. <clears throat> for these vital um, parts of the economy. And for the last 30 years in Mexico, um, a series of presidents have um, gave, given the United States even more control over Mexico than they had original, than they had you know, before. Right? So AMLO's big rallying cry is sovereignty. And how has he gone about that? The first one is energy, which you've pointed out. Um, when AMLO came into office, there was a situation where foreign multinationals uh, had their tentacles all over the national grid, right? Uh, the idea of these foreign multinationals led by the Spanish company Iberdrola, led by the Italian company Enel, was to basically <clears throat> do business with the national grid, um, creating a series of so-called partnerships, right? Um, for a dollar or a peso with, uh, with companies, wherein they could create energy and then sell energy to other private companies through the national grid. The idea was eventually to run the Federal Electricity Commission out of business and set up a situation that exists now in Spain, where Iberdrola runs the show, or in Great Britain, where people are you know, paying 
uh, you know, well over a thousand pounds a year in energy bills, <clears throat> the problem that exists in some US states, Texas, um, <clears throat> and others, right? So AMLA said, look, what we're gonna do is prioritize um, public sources of energy first, and then if we need more, yeah, we'll buy from private companies. We've got no problem with that. But he, you know, he wasn't about to let the Federal Electricity Commission be run into the ground, which was what was going to happen <clears throat> if it had headed any more down that road. So he passed an energy reform <clears throat> law, um, which was bitterly opposed, bitterly opposed by Iberdrola, by Enel. They had their lobbyists all over the floor of the Congress, the Mexican Congress, um, the Economists, uh, the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal went berserk, right? And this is really what got a lot of the anti-AMLO press really going. It was bad enough already. But this idea that Mexico can and should control its own energy resources is simply heresy for the United States. Energy resources are for the United States to, to pick and use at their will. And that, you know, you see the head of the U.S. Southern Command, you know, crisscrossing South America, basically saying lithium is ours. <clears throat> And if we're not going to get it, you know, China's going to get it, trying to play, you know, scare stories with China. You know, actually, the lithium belongs to the countries it's in. You know, Argentina, Argentina, Este, Bolivia and Chile have 65 percent, I think, of the world's lithium stores. And if you add Mexico in there, which has large lithium stores in Sonora, dangerously close to the U.S. border, you're up over 70 <laughs> percent. So that's going to be a huge issue um, in the next decade. You see that Bolivia nationalized its lithium. Chile is in the process of doing that. Uh, Peru, they just sent, you know, <clears throat> they're just sending U.S. troops down to train Peruvian soldiers under the Dina Boluarte regime. Um, you know, how nice of the United States, how altruistic to help Peru, uh, you know, <clears throat> train its military. And there's a lot of there's a lot of lithium and there's a lot of mining interests in 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 Peru, right? So that's what's going on there. So energy sovereignty is very important for AMLO. Another one is food sovereignty. Um, you know, after the NAFTA agreement in the 90s, there was huge immigration out of uh, the Mexican countryside and larger immigration into the United States. You know? I think it's important to point out nobody wants to immigrate. People want to stay home. And people you know, who are in the United States, a lot of them want to go back, <clears throat> given the opportunities to do so. But first of all, you had a free trade agreement, which made Small peasant farmers have to compete with giant subsidized American agribusiness like Monsanto. Um, <clears throat> and you set up a situation where people couldn't compete, right? So there was a huge exodus from the countryside, uh, which the Clinton administration knew at the time, which is why they started beefing up border security as soon as NAFTA was passed. They knew this was going to happen. So the idea is AMLA wants to help farmers, how to help um, the rural community here get back up on their feet, you know, um, guaranteed prices for certain crops, um, farm supports, a tree planting program um, <clears throat> to get Mexico producing its own food, right? And that goes in line with a new, with two new um, refinery projects, one that they're building um, in the coast of Tabasco and the Veracruz, sorry, and another one that actually bought a refinery in, in Houston because Mexico is an oil producing country but it was sending all its oil to the United States to be refined. And then we had to buy it back as gasoline. So the idea is, all right, we have our own energy. And as we make an energy transition, well, we're going to refine our own, uh, we're going to find our energy, we're going to produce our own food. Um, <clears throat> there's increased the minimum wage. There's been a, a series of measures to kind of, um, you know, help families out. And the idea is exactly that, you know, to create the conditions where people can live in the cities and in the countryside. The other big variable is violence, right? <clears throat> uh, after the 2006 election, which uh, was a fraudulent election, uh, Felipe Calderon won a fraudulent election, uh, backed by the U.S., of course. Um, he's militarized the country with the so-called idea of this uh, war on drugs, right? Um, supported by the United States through the Merida Initiative, supported, uh, you know, the Fast and Furious, um, <clears throat> all of these measures that, you know, focused everything on security and nothing on development <clears throat> and sending in U.S. weapons into the country. Yeah, th th this was my next question. And I just did want to add what you mentioned previously. I was recently in L.A. and one of my taxi drivers was from uh, mm -hmm. a young lady from 
El Salvador, who had been for a half decade in the, in the U.S., and uh, I think she crossed uh, illegally and telling me about you know other people who continuing to do so. But she, she didn't speak very well English. We were speaking Spanish the whole time. But you know, yeah, I, I and I'm just curious because I'm even for myself, I don't know where I belong anymore because I'm I'm I've got three <laughs> citizenships. But kind of what to what you're saying, I prefer Mexico to the United States. Uh, I'm going to be here for uh, for the foreseeable, foreseeable future. And I asked this uh, girl from El Salvador, like. It's it's just what you said. It's the economic issue. She's like she makes no money in El Salvador. There's no prospects. If she could make half of what she was making in L.A., she'd go back to uh, El Salvador. <laughs> so the, the, just to your point, like th that that's the stuff that I hear. Uh, you know, I'm sure there are a few Mexicans that would prefer. You sure, know, the, the, there'll the, be the, some. Yeah, just like but, we're living here, right? There'd always be people who want to travel and live abroad. But as Amlo says very clearly, people should emigrate because they want to, not because they have to. That's he wants to create a Mexico where people immigrate only because they want to, right? <clears throat> yeah. So we was, people have that choice. And then uh, to the violence and insecurity, you know, you wrote a piece uh, I think in March uh, about how the U.S. government is complicit in the drug cartels' crimes and this all this stuff with uh, the cartels. You know, we, we've got journalists like Gary Webb um, and and, right? and and many sure. others. Yeah, you, know, you know, Alfred McCoy who wrote about um, CIA trafficking cocaine in in uh, Southeast Asia, and you know, we had the British Empire trafficking opium, and so. Um, you know, this is deep politics. And basically, my view is that, you know, U.S. government intelligence is involved with the drug cartels. So uh, so are parts of the uh, Mexican uh, government. My guest in December, LAPD retired detective Mike Rothmiller, actually, in our podcast, mm -hmm. he said in back in he was in Mexico City in the 80s and he had the head of I forget which uh, if it was the F was it the the the, the Fafi? agency. Yeah. The yeah the Afi probably right yeah the, the, he he was basically admitting yeah. that he he was helping mm -hmm. a, the CIA uh, run yeah. drugs through Mexico yeah. so what, what's your take on uh you know the violent security issues and the in the cartels and you know all this talk about Chapo you know what what's sort of the real story here well I think you're absolutely right in the way you frame it <clears throat> and it's very interesting that um, the former head of public security under the Calderon administration, Genaro Garcia Luna, <clears throat> recently went on trial in New York City. Now, <clears throat> this is somebody who, um, you know, it's been proven he was in hock with the Sinaloa cartel, right? But the United States loved him at the time, you know? They were all over Garcia Luna, right? <clears throat> uh, when Garcia Luna left office, he set up a security enterprise in, in Miami, and who were his partners? You know, a former CIA agent, a former FBI agent, a former DA agent, they run the gamut, right? So it's very interesting that the trial was conducted in such a way that nothing about Garcia Luna's collusion with either the Mexican government or the United States government came out at that trial. They focused very narrowly on certain things. They got the conviction they wanted and they got a life sentence for him. And so I think that's very telling. Um, you know, now you see uh, this idea now that the DEA is going after the Chapitos, right? The, the next generation of the Sinaloa cartel, right? For years, for years, the DEA has been telling us that all we have to do is take care of the capos, right? All we have to do is take care of, you know, the heads of these organizations, and we're going to dismantle these organizations. It's called the so-called kingpin strategy. It's done nothing. <clears throat> By this, you know, even the DEA up there saying we got rid of El Chapo and now it's the El Chapitos. Now we have to go after the El Chapitos. So it becomes a never ending story. It becomes a never ending story. And it's a very convenient way to keep the arms flowing, to keep the money flowing, to keep the drugs flowing, to keep the security budgets flowing. Right. And it's a very convenient way to pressure the Mexican government. Right. You see, so you have Ann Milgram, the head of the DEA, who's right now under investigation herself for no bid contracts. Right. For, you know, corruption. You know, basically threatening the AMLO administration, saying, we'll go after this wherever it leads. What's going on in the DEA? <clears throat> What's been going on in the DEA the last year? Arrest after arrest after arrest after arrest of DEA agents in collusion with members of organized crime. <clears throat> it's in the AP. I mean, it's not a secret. It's just not being focused on by the by the press, right? The former head of the DEA in, United, in Mexico, Nicolas Palmieri, was run out of the DEA very quietly, though, because he was hanging out with defense lawyers in Miami who were representing criminals. They're representing, you know, criminals for organized crime. Palmieri is over there hanging out with them, bringing bottles of wine, right? 
Uh, two other DEA agents were arrested in uh, for also, you know, handing over information to Miami defense lawyers. The Palmieri affair was hardly mentioned, hardly mentioned. He was whisked out of Mexico um, and then allowed to resign the DEA a year later. Not be fired. He was allowed to resign and then just quickly slip into anonymity. <clears throat> Yet, the, the story constantly you hear in the U.S. press is, it's all Mexico. Mexico is corrupt. Mexico is doing it. Mexico this. Mexico that. The fentanyl. And if it's not Mexico, it's trying to link Mexico to China to try to kill two birds with one stone, right? Because the United States wants to go with, to war with China now, right? That's, that's the next chapter after Ukraine and whatever else. So <clears throat> it's, it's just an enormous, an enormous level of, of hypocrisy here where uh, U.S. intelligence agencies, you know, in quotes, think they can run around in Mexico, do what they want, uh, that nobody will stop them, nobody should stop them, nobody should check them, and they can just simply pass the ball on to, on to Mexico. Is there corruption in Mexico? Well, of course there is. There's corruption on both sides because it's linked, and that's what they don't want you to know, right? So this goes back to your other question about why AMLO has been careful with the military. You know, AMLO came to office in late 2018 in a situation in which the federal police apparatus, who'd been under the control of Garcia Luna, totally corrupt, totally corrupted, uh, as were state level and municipal level uh, police. AMLO looked around, surveyed the scene. He said, you know, nobody trusts the cops in this country at any level. But the army has a high approval rating because they've seen they've been seen as despite numerous abuses, right, uh, as that's the institution that comes out and helps in natural disasters. It's the institution that's um, seen as, you know, patri the patriotic institute institution here in Mexico. So he took the, le the less bad option, right, of <clears throat> leaning on the military for uh, security purposes through um, an institution that's called the National Guard, right? which um, is made up of, you know, military members, right? But the idea is to, over the years, um, create more of a civilian, you know, base for the members and, you know, eventually end that militarization. That's now been extended for a few more years. Ahead. I don't like it. <clears throat> I'm not a fan of it. But I can understand why in the context AMLO saw when he came into power, uh, he decided to do that. Now, let's also remember that Latin America has a long history of coups, of military-backed coups, and of U.S.-backed coups through the military. You know, Chile, <clears throat> Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil. I mean, you can go through country after country. Um, <clears throat> AMLO was a freshman in college at the UNAM in Mexico City when Salvador Allende was overthrown by a U.S. Henry Kissinger-backed coup in 1973. So that was a very stark lesson for the politicians of his generation. How can we get to power and not be overthrown by the United States? That's that's the issue, right? Especially with Mexico being so close to the United States, um, sharing you know two thousand mile border, you know two thousand kilometer border. Um, you know the the famous quote: "Poor Mexico is so far from God, so close to the United States." Right? Very important in foreign policy. So. That's the that's the alliance he's made. Now, at the same time, you know, Mexico has set up a truth commission to investigate what was called the dirty war in the 1970s when the U.S. when the Mexican military um, took some very uh, violent action against paramilitary groups that had grown out of the 68 student movement here. Um, there's also a commission set up to explore the Ayotzinapa um, uh, killings of uh, normal school students back in 2015. So it's not like he's, you know, uh, letting giving the military a free pass. They're investigating the military to an extent that's never happened before. And the military is responding in kind, right? And you, you see this with this Pegasus issue, the Israeli um, <clears throat> spying software that was originally uh, imported by the Calderon uh, administration and used extensively under President uh, Peña Nieto. Um, you see even subsecretary Alejandro Encinas, who's really trying to get to the bottom of Ayotzinapa, which turns out he's being spied on. You know, 
I think it's important to understand in, in, in politics that you know winning office doesn't necessarily mean winning power. There is this, uh, you know, you've mentioned the deep state. Uh, you know, the Mexican military is a strong force and it's been there for a long time. And just because you're in the presidency doesn't mean you have, you know, total control over what's happening over there. So AMLO's been cautious. Now, he's also given the military a lot of infrastructure projects uh, and, and whatnot. He says so that's to avoid multinational companies getting their mitts on them. You know, there's an argument to be made there. Um, throughout the 80s and 90s, all of Mexican, you know, everything was privatized in Mexico. Everything, everything, everything. From the banks to the airlines to the railways to, you know, uh, the mines to the health service. So, you know, he, he thinks that led to a kind of a style of crony capitalism, a kleptocracy, and he doesn't want that to go back to that. He thinks putting that in the armed forces' hands is a way of preventing that from happening. You know, I'll leave that out there, but I just I think it's important to understand his motives because the kind of the standard line in the American Anglo-American press is he's a dictator, he's a messianic leader, typical Latin American leader, he's an autocrat, you know, <clears throat> and they're not understanding the context of Mexican politics and Latin American politics. They're not understanding the context of the presidents before AMLO, the situation he inherited, uh, and they just kind of, you know, whip out some very easy uh, racist tropes that they use for every single Latin American president, basically. Yeah, and, and maybe just you know, on the before we leave the security aspect, we've been seeing calls now. I can't remember all of their names. Uh, Representative Dan Crenshaw, I think Lindsey Graham, uh, and others now. And I've never seen this in my lifetime. This sort of rhetoric and actually push for legislation to basically they're calling to invade Mexico. And I mean, first right. you get you've got like the, the the history. I mean, for me, like like. The, 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 this is insane, you know. As as an American Mexican, it's like this is crazy. It's wrong, and in, in, in every single which way you cut it, but it's kind of linked to what we've been discussing because you mentioned just across the border you got the lithium. So it's like you know they're selling us the the cartel excuse, which they're involved with the cartels, uh, the U.S. government. Uh, but you know, do they want to get to the lithium? Um, and, and you know, I a north Mexico is considered to be under northern uh, the command. And I, I think there is also this project, uh, which is related to NAFTA and USMCA of North American Union, where they sort of want to integrate Mexico into the US and Canada. I, I think I did the last living interview with Robert Pastor, who was, you know, the sort of he he, he visited the tech here. Um, he passed like a month after I, I Skyped him into my class with the students and he was pushing North American mm -hmm. integration. And so I'm wondering if they're exaggerating or intentionally exacerbating the security of the situation so then they can come in to, you know, as you've mentioned, Mexico started pulling away from the U.S. Are they trying to get it back? And what do you make of these calls to invade Mexico? I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, you've seen the AMLO administration uh, push for greater regional Latin American integration. Right. They've been very critical of the Organization of American States, the OAS, which they see as a U.S. tool in Latin America. The OAS was basically an institution that provoked um, the coup in, in Bolivia in 2019. Right. Um, and they're attempting to create um, regional integration through an organization called the CELAC, right, which unites Latin American and, and, uh, and Caribbean countries. You saw with the Summit of the Americas scandal, uh, was scandal issue last year, where AMLO said, you know, if it's the summit of the Americas, every country should go. And then if people disagree, let them hash it out, right? The United States couldn't have it. <clears throat> they had to decide who, who goes and, and who doesn't, right? So I think you see that, that push for greater Latin American uh, integration. And it's also interesting that Mexico is trying to set up now um, an integration with lithium producing countries, Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, to do uh, some form of um, a regional integration around lithium, not only to lithium as a as a raw material, but you know, finished products regarded, you know, batteries and such. Uh, Bolivia, right before Morales was forced out of office, was setting up an electric car um, <clears throat> uh, initiative. So I think you know these these are these are important factors. So that's one factor, right? This, this idea that they see maybe Mexico slipping away, although Mexico has been quite careful in that respect. I think they know they've got the United States very close there. AMLO has never said he wants to join BRICS, for example. 
whereas Argentina has been very open and saying, please, we want to be in BRICS, right? Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, the biggest trading partner of practically every country now in South America is China, not the United States, very different from why it was 20 years ago. Mexico is the exception, right? Uh, because of its, you know, of, um, trade agreements and its, and its integration there. Right? So that's, that, that's certainly one aspect of it, right? Um, I think, you know, lithium and minerals are another aspect of it, right? I mean, just there. And then this idea of using uh, fentanyl as an excuse, you know, is it's a very easy campaign issue, right? The Mexico bash, you know, um, <clears throat> you know, Mexico is seen as a weaker country. Uh, it doesn't have a very organized lobby in the United States, right? The Cuba lobby is very um, voice, is very organized in Florida, right? Um, the Mexican lobby, despite the fact that there are a lot more Mexicans than Cubans in the United States, is not as organized. <clears throat> um, and so you see this awful rhetoric from every single uh, Republican candidate um, you know, that wants to bomb or invade uh, Mexico, right? Democrats haven't been any better, really, because they haven't, you know, they haven't said anything. They've let it go on. And the Democrats are getting a free pass on, you know, what the DEA is doing down here. All of a sudden, the Democrats are in love with the intelligence agencies, right? So unfortunately, you know, they're not investigating from Congress what they should be doing. You only, the, you know, a Republican Senator, Charles Grassley, has said, I want to know what the DEA is doing in Mexico. I want to know what the FBI is doing in Mexico. I want those documents. So on one hand, I wrote about this in Jacobin a couple of uh, articles ago. You've got the Republicans who want to bomb, right? Um, every single Republican candidate, right? Trump has battle, it wants battle plans uh, being drawn up to invade Mexico if he wins. But then you have the Democrats on the other side who want, who have got a cause. They've got this cause. They want to save Mexico from itself. You know, when AMLO passed an electoral reform law, you know, a few months ago, oh, oh, they were so aghast because AMLO was supposedly attacking, the, you know, this great harbinger of democracy in Mexico, this institute that had bestowed democracy on the Mexican people. Right? Despite the fact that that electoral institute had done nothing to stop electoral fraud after electoral fraud uh, in this country for years. And what I wrote about is this could potentially set up a perfect storm, right? This Republican bellicose side, but also this Democratic interventionist side of having a cause, right? They think, you know, oh, we've got to save Mexico from this autocratic, you know, messianic dictator. I don't know what's worse, right? Um, <clears throat> I don't know what's worse. I don't know if it's, you know, um, you know, Fox or, you know, uh, those kinds of media banging the drumbeat on Mexico. You know, Senator John Kennedy came out and said, you know, if it, <clears throat> if it wasn't for us, Mexico would be eating out of a can of cat food and, uh, you know, sleeping out behind the outback. I don't even know what he meant by that. I mean, I, what I, does he I, mean? I was taken what aback. Are they talking I, about? As an American, yeah. Mexican, I'm like, that what is that crazy. supposed to mean? Yeah, that's that's it's insulting, really. <laughs> So I don't know what's worse, that or these kind of um, progressive media outlets like The Atlantic, you know, which now have David Frum there and Ann Applebaum, and they come down here and they hang out with rich people and they hang out at rich hotels and they go to op one opposition rally and now they're automatically um, experts on Mexico. And they go back and they warn their readers about the dangers of democracy being under attack in Mexico by by what? By a democratically elected leader passing democratic laws with a democratic majority in a democratic Congress. Right. And this is where I see the United States again and again in Latin America and the world creating the conditions, the very conditions that they then decry. Right. Mexico is trying to reform its country so that people can stay in Mexico and create a prosperous Mexico. And the United States is doing everything possible to undercut that. So the United States, again, is creating the very immigration problem that they then are all up in arms about. You would think that they would support someone who's trying to reform the country. You know, the Mexican economy is growing. They're setting up, you know, uh, 
Foreign investment is growing in Mexico. There is now support for students to stay in school. If you stay in school and get good grades, you get a scholarship, right? There's a pension for older people that people never had before. A lot of times before people had to immigrate just to send money back to take care of their elderly relatives. So now there's a pension for the, for those people, a universal pension, right? There's support for farmers. It's to see um, the minimum wage has risen. There's There's been housing and pension reform, basic stuff, you know, basic stuff, right? To create the conditions where people can prosper at home. You think the United States would want that. But they don't want that because it's all just a big lie. They're just hypocrites. What they want is to have multinational companies controlling Mexican resources. And the whole, all the rhetoric about, you know, immigration is just all totally hypocritical, right? So when, you know, the energy reform law was passed, you had the American ambassador, Ken Salazar, who was a fossil fuel lobbyist for years in the U.S., right? As Secretary of the Interior under Obama, did very little you know, uh, if the Keystone disaster in the Gulf of Mexico, right? Um, coming down here and saying, we're very concerned. We're very concerned about the Mexican energy reform. Mexico is just trying to do what any country in the world would want to do, is just control its own resources for its own population. That's what it wants to do, right? But instead, you have this hysterical rhetoric, hysterical rhetoric, of autocrat, of dictator, of messianic leader, right? And of a credulous Mexican public who follows this, you know, this messianic leader because they have no agency of their own, right? Because that's the way Latin Americans are to people in the United States, right? They're religious, they're superstitious, they follow charismatic leaders, they have no decision-making power of their own. Why is AMLO still popular five years later? Because I think people see that. He's doing his best to make important changes here. You know, I think it's a very rational decision. But the American press never attributes rational decision-making powers to people in Latin America, ever. <clears throat> if you look at the history of press against AMLO over the last few years, the idea is to make him look to, out to be a superstitious, uh, you know, um, messianic person who, um, you know, during the pandemic, he made a little, you know, little comment that he had a little amulet that you know protected him. It was just a line. It was just a line in the press conference. It was just a thing you say, kind of a thing, because somebody had given it to him on one of his tours. People were like, oh, look, Amlo believes in amulets. Amlo believes that you can uh, stop COVID with amulets, right? Or recently, he just published a little photo because he's very good with social media. Amlo is excellent on social media, um, you know, <clears throat> much better than a lot of other world leaders. And he was doing a tour through the Yucatan Peninsula, and he said, look, this is like what's called an alushe, which is kind of a mythical Maya being. Looks like what, you know, one of those. So all of a sudden, you know, the U.S. press is like, does AMLO believe in mythical beings? It's just insulting. Do you think they would do that with Macron in France? Do you think they would do that with Istem, with, with any European leader, you know, with Sunak? Of course they wouldn't. But because AMLO is in Latin America, they can make him out to be, you know, almost subhuman. Just like, you know, uh, the New York Times says AMLO is volatile and mercurial. Why is he volatile? Explain it to us. They don't explain it. They just say that's what he is. And they just expect you to just buy their line, right? Uh, the New York Times said, you know, Natalie Kitcherev there, the correspondent, Mexico's economy was tanking. She repeated, they repeated this several times over the last year. No, they said cratering, sorry, cratering. Now, Mexico's economy grew 3.1% last year. We can agree or disagree with that being a, you know, good enough or not, but it's not cratering. Mm -hmm. They just lie. They just lie, right? And this is the most maddening thing about um, you know, tracking U.S. press on Mexico, which is unfortunately part of my job. You just got to weed through this stuff from the New York Times, from the Washington Post, you know, from the LA Times, uh, from the Atlantic Monthly, uh, through to the Economist and the Financial Times. And it's just, you know, if you don't even try to report objectively on Mexico, you're never going to get your policy right. Because you're just, people don't even know what's happening. So it's, um, it's a maddening, uh, it's a maddening process. <laughs>
Yeah, and, and, and I would just add to what you said. I mean, per, personally, I'm not a believer in this, you know, systemic racism thing. I mean, I don't even think about right race. My wife's uh, Mexican. I became a Mexican. You know, whatever. I don't think of those terms. I think a lot of the stuff in the U.S. is just all this hyped up sort of woke stuff. But I can tell you, uh, you know, there's American exceptionalism, which is uh, apparent in not you know in the whole in the government, but in, in uh, not all Americans. But every time I go back uh, to the U.S., I will come across upper class Americans who literally, you know, say stuff like dirty Mexicans, kind of what you're alluding to. And it's for me, it's repulsive. It's 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 disgusting. Uh, and, and, you know, the, any other, you know, I used to live in Mongolia. I'd have the same reaction from, you know, pe some people that I knew, Europeans and Americans who would say, ah, Mongolia, third world, you know, garbage, Mexico. And I, I, that's that's for me, that's very, very wrong, immoral, uh, uh, unethical. And uh, I would just also mention what, what you're talking about, the security issue. It's almost basically a bipartisan thing. I had a great interview. Yeah. A couple of years ago with Todd Miller, uh, who, for me, did groundbreaking research in his book where he talks about the border security complex and how it's the Dem Democrats and Republicans. They're building up this high tech, uh, you know, military sort of security complex uh, border. It's, it's, it's all about the money and AI and drones and all this stuff. It's it's totally, you know, and most of these things were, were almost like being run by a one party system in the U.S. And y you mentioned the economy, and, and I want to get your thoughts on that. I, I As you mentioned, I recently read yesterday that foreign direct investment is on its way to hit a record i think in in mexico things just look up in mexico from my uh perspective yeah. <laughs> and um th there there have been these false rumors going around the last like month that mexico is going to join BRICS. I, I could not find any you know verifiable mexico official. hasn't applied to join BRICS. right they, they, i think th those are just uh rumors that were incorrect but uh in general where do you see uh mexico uh economically and do you, I, it, it does seem it's pulling away from the, uh, it can never go fully away from Uncle Sam, but it does seem hmm. to be, um, you know, moving into the multipolar camp. And, you know, AMLO is saying he, he's countering the official narrative on, on the Ukraine war and, and, and stuff like that. So your thoughts on the economy and multipolarity? Sure. <clears throat> you know, I think multipolarity is the coming reality of the world. So every country is going to have to adjust to that <clears throat> in some form, right? Um, you know, there's the process of de-dollarization and uh, regional alliances and, uh, you know, and, and such going on, right? Um, <clears throat> so that's a reality that every country is going to have to come to terms with. And it's interesting that Mexico is doing interestingly well in that because all of the doomsayers when AMLO took office is, oh, there's going to be a devaluation. Oh, there's going to be a recession. And, you know, um, <clears throat> you know, the uh, peso is doing well against the dollar. Um, the economy is growing. <clears throat> Foreign direct investment is up. There's been a process of what's called uh, nearshoring, where Asian companies, um, you know, <clears throat> invest in um, um, invest in Mexico to be closer to the you know the, the U.S. Uh, and Canada uh, Canadian market, right? Um, and I think <clears throat> AMLO was ahead of ahead of the curve on the energy sovereignty issue. Right. Because he started this before COVID and before the supply chain issues that COVID uh, you know, caused. So. Um, you know, all of a sudden, you know, globalization, people had to question it again. You know, what happens to globalization in a pandemic economy? What happens to globalization in a war economy? What happens to globalization when you can't get everything on the supply chain? Right. So sovereignty needs another look. And he was already um, uh, doing that, you know, ahead of the curve on the on the pandemic, right? So I think that was very important, you know. Um, you know, energy bills in Mexico are ridiculously low compared to the U.S. and Europe. I mean, they're ridiculously low, what we pay for, for electricity here. Right? I, I, I can't shut up about it. I, I can't shut up. Yeah. I, I, I just go on about this all the time. Like, yeah. I'm still yeah. in shock after a decade here. Uh, you can pay, like, your your water bill uh, an estimate for the whole year i paid 50 bucks for the whole year like in america they pay right. hundreds of bucks a, a month and then electricity i think i paid 20 bucks uh last month and just you know your your, your cell phone i pay 10 bucks a month for a cell phone and just it's it's so <laughs> affordable and no of course salaries are also lower right they're on the rise but there's also been you know that's also that's also an issue here in in mexico but still i mean nothing compared to you know what people are paying for utilities um, in the U.S. And, and in Europe, right? So that's that's an important issue. And I think Mexico, you know, historically, Mexico had an important um, 
role in Latin America as kind of a big brother in Latin America, right? Because it's the largest Spanish speaking country in Latin America. It's the largest Spanish speaking economy. Of course, Brazil is a, it's a Portuguese speaking country. It's got a larger economy. But of the Spanish speaking countries, you know, it's Mexico. And Mexico has always historically had, you know, um, a large production of, um, you know, music and uh, and movies. So people throughout Latin America kind of know Mexican shows and they know Mexican movies and um, and they know Mexican singers. So there's this idea of kind of looking up to, to Mexico, this kind of regional leadership role, um, <clears throat> which over the last 30 years, kind of Mexico let go and kind of accepted being more under the U.S. thumb. So now you see that coming back again. This is another thing the U.S. doesn't, doesn't like, right? So Mexico, like most of the global South, has been neutral on Ukraine, right? It's condemned the invasion, but is not, um, you know, sending arms or, and it's trying to, you know, push the sides to a peace agreement, right? AMLO has been very clear that he thinks that the Ukrainian war is being perpetuated to, uh, you know, support the arms industry. <clears throat> uh, very similar to Lula in Brazil in that respect. I think it's a pretty courageous thing to say. Um, you know, we've got the U.S. right above you. Um, he didn't, you know, he didn't support Juan Guaido in Venezuela. He doesn't support the Boluarte regime uh, in in Peru right now. You know, um, that's you know, actually the Peruvian Congress just named AMLO persona non grata in, uh, in in Peru. Um, but, you know, they sent a plane to rescue Evo Morales in 2019, probably saved his life. Right. So that's what I mean. It's it's um it's a regional leadership role. And if we go back to this Wolfowitz doctrine, with Paul Wolfowitz, kind of the two no-nos for the U.S. anywhere in the world is a country, one, having control of its natural resources, and two, having a regional leadership role. So that's where Mexico is chafing at um, <clears throat> chafing at Uncle, Uncle Sam there. And I think that has a lot to do with multipolarity because, you know, with this fentanyl debate, right, with, you know, the U.S. trying to dump the whole thing on fentanyl on Mexico. You know, as even the Cato Institute has pointed out, which is, you know, a conservative, you know, a think tank, most fentanyl is imported by Americans for Americans. So I think we have to be just careful with the rhetoric on this, right? That it, you know, can become very escalatory very quickly. Um, and I think an invasion of Mexico would be disastrous beyond anybody's dreams. I mean, if you think there's immigration now, how much immigration would there be after a, a military campaign in Mexico? Right at the U.S. border. With the cartels, including you know, uh, striking back even on U.S. soil. I mean, it would just be, uh, you know, pardon the word, it would be an absolute clusterfuck in every imaginable sense, right? That you know, it's just unimaginable what would happen there. Um, <clears throat> so with the fentanyl issue, you see China getting involved and saying the U.S. is trying to blame Mexico for this, right? So all of a sudden, it's not just the Mex Mexico and the U.S. and the fentanyl issue; it's China. Right. It's Asia. Right. So that's where multipolarity comes into this. Right. Um, so interesting times. I think transition times. I think we're in a transition time in the world. Yeah. And uh, on the fentanyl issue. The U.S. haven't caught up. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. I, I just add on the, on the drug issue again, going back in the U.S. And I'm just seeing increased drug uh, culture, drug use. I mean, I was just uh, there recently. And this is I mean, for me, it's unusual guy gets i'm waiting across the street buying groceries and a guy just gets off the bus and starts i mean you can see he's, he's on drugs and he starts talking to me he's like what's up yo like he wants something for me yeah. I'm, like, I'm just walking quickly away it's like i don't want to get caught i don't want to get caught up in sure. um nothing and i guess my final question then for you would be uh you know i came down to mexico 2010 i was hired from abroad i thought i'd stay a year or two and just ended up staying uh forever and becoming mexican and um I enjoyed here and, and you know many things we've discussed the culture the the, the weather the, the the people um the low cost of living just many things and so uh, mm -hmm. many people uh, um in general come down uh to mexico i think uh by lake chapala you've got the biggest expat u.s canadian expat community i think it's tens of thousands uh mm -hmm. mostly retirees living there but you know a lot of people are coming to mexico um Many have fled the Western world for Mexico in recent years because of the tyrannical, you know, pandemic uh, dictates. Uh, others have fled because of lower cost of living, and um, you know, Mexico retains sanity when it comes to culture, values, and society. And people also feel yeah. fr freer yeah. here. And 
you know, a lot of libertarian-ish people, and a lot of some of my listeners have actually met them, uh, had lunch with them uh, down here in Mexico. So w- what would you say about people thinking about coming to Mexico, your experience here? People ask me, like, how dangerous it is, is it? You've mentioned, you know, the U.S. hypes it up. Uh, I've been here for over a decade. I'm still alive. Pretty much everyone I know is still alive. So I guess that's, you know, a good lit- lit- litmus test. So, you know, y- y- your thoughts on any of this? Well, you know, I've been here for 23 years. So, I mean, I, I came with the intention of staying for a year and, uh, you know, I fell in love with the country and I stayed and I've, I've created a very happy uh, life for myself here. You know? Um, you know, Mexico in general is a very welcoming uh, culture. It's very open to, to foreigners and to immigration. Uh, in general, uh, which I think is a wonderful virtue because, you know, Americans are not always that way with foreigners there. I think the openness of Mexicans is something we can learn from. Um, You know, it's got millennial millennial traditions, you know, thousands of years traditions, what I mean, Um, a profound uh, culture, which expresses itself in cuisine, literature, arts. Um, There is so much more to Mexico than this. caricaturized version you get in the U.S. uh, and the U.S. press. And, you know, I would encourage people to find out more about Mexico. I think more the more people understand about Mexico, the less likely the kind of rhetoric you see from the U.S. press and politicians will stick in the U.S. If more people know Mexico, know its people, uh, they'd be less likely to be taken in by this idea of let's bomb them or, you know, they're this messianic leader and all this stuff. You know, they won't be as easily taken in. Um, I think it's just a question of, like in any country, uh, being sensitive to, you know, local culture, not being the quote unquote ugly American, you know, the spring breaker, right? Or the kind of the digital nomad that's only only on your laptop and only hanging out and speaking English with other people and not getting involved with people or getting involved in your community, you know? Um, People who come here and make money in dollars are making more money than people who make money in pesos. That's just a fact. So I think the question is always to think about, if you're going to come down here, great. But what can you give back? You know, <clears throat> like anywhere, what can you what can you give back, right? Without, you know, having a savior complex or trying to think yourself superior. But like in any community you live in anywhere, in your own community at home, how can you give back? You know, <clears throat> that's what I try to think about. You know, how can you, how can you give back here? And I think that then you can create a very stable relationship with people. Uh, you know, uh, something that happened, I guess, not too long ago that kind of reminded me of what you just mentioned. Uh, you know, oftentimes you have to wait uh, at, at a shop or, you know, sometimes it can be a while for whatever service or thing you got to do. And on some occasion, I had to wait a while. Uh, and I got used to this, you know, the first time I left the U.S. when I was living in Mongolia and then mm-hmm. uh, elsewhere. You just get used to because it, in America, it's like you want everyone wants it now. They don't have patience. But in you yeah. know many third world countries, you just have to wait a long time for stuff and you get used to it it's normal you don't complain and someone told me like i can't believe like you have all this patience you're like you're not saying anything you're waiting for like i don't know how it was hours or something for whatever and i think it's to, just uh what you what you mentioned the other foreigners probably freak out and make a you know uh, a scandal and they're used to that which is annoying and so uh yeah as as you said you know just come here live like uh, the people and um if if some of these exceptionalists can just get past that sort of um uh you know whatever it is that they have this this dislike disdain for mexico and as you say hang out with the people here um the, it's a whole new uh world and then if you've got any final thought for us and if not um let us know where are the best places we can uh find you online, uh, read your writings or projects that you have and so forth? Well, no, um, just to, yeah, I think this is a great, this is a great dialogue. I think it's, it's great that we're always, you know, um, finding uh, different ways to, to, to dialogue and talk about this thing. So I appreciate it. Uh, I'm on Twitter, uh, Kurt Hackbarth on Twitter. Um, I'm on Jacobin. I do a monthly uh, piece on, on Mexico. And I think that, you know, um, my stuff, that's all just, you know, do Kurt Hackbar, Jacobin, and Google, and all the articles are there, all right? My most recent piece is on the DEA stuff that we were talking about, uh, you know. Uh, I always try to give enough context in the articles so that, you know, even if, you know, I don't know, um, you know, the last hundred year history of Mexico, there's enough context in the articles to kind of try to navigate navigate through them. Um, <clears throat> here in Mexico, I have a column um, uh, in, a, in a magazine called Sentido Comun for Spanish speakers. 
And that's it. You know, I'm on different shows a lot, different kind of panel shows uh, down here. And uh, we also have a, um, a publishing house. It's called Matanga, Taller Editorial, Matanga. That's also on all the social media, Matanga. And uh, our goal is to publish up, um, up and coming uh, Oaxacan writers, because I live in the state of Oaxaca, uh, of short stories and novels. <clears throat> so that's our focus. And um, we also have a workshops. We also produce um, journals, blank journals, um, recipes, so anything that has to do with book binding. <clears throat> so we're a, we're a, a, a book binding workshop and also a publishing house. And that's um, editorialmatanga.com. Uh, and there's some interesting stuff there too. So that's that's one of our cultural projects. All right. And um, that's it. All right. All, all of those links uh, are in the description so people can follow you on um, Twitter and, and uh, everywhere else. And uh, fantastic uh, analysis. Hopefully you join us again in the future. And thank you for being on Geopolitics and Empire, Kurt. Sure. Take care. I hope you enjoyed this Geopolitics and Empire podcast. The website is geopoliticsandempire.com, and I encourage you to sign up for the free email list that goes out with each podcast and every weekend with a collection of news headlines. The newsletter and website are our last lines of defense. We're being censored and deplatformed. It's nearly impossible to find Geopolitics and Empire on the Google search engine. We've been blacklisted. YouTube frequently takes down our videos with strikes, Facebook restricts our page, Reddit and Twitter take down posts, and after the Associated Press mentioned Geopolitics and Empire in a 2021 article co-written with NATO, our Patreon account was terminated. Vimeo also terminated our Pro account. The best free way to help Geopolitics and Empire is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or elsewhere and subscribe to all of our media channels. You can find the video broadcast now on five platforms, Odyssey, Rockfin, Rumble, BitChute, and Brighteon. You can find the audio broadcast on the podcast ecosystem, SoundCloud, Apple, Spotify, and so on. My current favorite social media channels are Twitter and Telegram, but you can also find us on Gab, MeWe, Minds, Float, VK, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Finally, Geopolitics and Empire is in dire need of funding to continue. You can leave a donation, purchase a consultation with the host, or become a member to receive additional benefits. We also produce a weekly broadcast called Dissident Thinker for members and Rockfin subscribers only. We will continue to fight the good fight come hell or high water. Thank you for listening.